um, we host the whoa. We host the student advisory panel in Avery. If you guys have gone to that uh, every semester, um, and we have a hackathon coming up. Um, it's January 19th through the 20th, so pretty early next semester. Um, we had a lot of people attend last year, um, and uh, it went really well. So if you went last year, it's very similar. Um, it's going to be in Avery. It's a 24-hour hackathon. Um, it's completely free. Uh, it's teams of up to four creating whatever you want to create. Uh, so it's a really, really cool opportunity to go to. There'll be around like $1,500 in prizes and a bunch of free stuff for you to get. And you can create anything you want and there's no experience necessary. Uh, there'll also be workshops there and students will lead it and also industry reps. And then the judges will also be professors, graduate students, and industry reps. Yeah, we're gonna feed you. Uh, we give you snacks, dinner, uh, completely free. Uh, plus the prizes and like swag, like we have like t-shirts and um, different like gear that uh, we're giving out. Um, so it's it's kind of like come and go, and you're working uh, with different teams to develop things. So it's a really good picture of like um, like how to develop uh, a project from the ground up with different people. Um, the information to sign up is all on this website, just cornhacks.com. Um, and I wrote again the the dates up here. It's a Saturday, Sunday, and if it helps, that Monday right afterwards is uh, Martin Luther King Day, so you won't have school. So it's a three-day weekend. Um, so th this takes up 24 hours of that. Um, your professor is actually going to be one of the the judges at the event. So, cool. Thank you. Any questions? All right. You Thank you. Thank you. All right, so again, at the end of the, uh, today, we've got a couple of people coming in that are going to administer kind of a survey uh, kind of test. Don't worry. It's optional. It's, uh, uh, it, will, it won't impact your grade at all. It's, it's just research. Uh, but we've only got uh, three uh, meeting times left, including today. So today and on Monday, we're going to be focusing on, uh, con conceptually, we'll be focusing on database systems, uh, database management systems, RDBMSs. Uh, so there'll be a couple of alphabet soups to, to pick up today. Uh, and uh, we're going to keep it very high level, though. Uh, then on Wednesday of next week, that's going to be devoted entirely to the review for the final, uh, which is the, the date. Is, uh, I'll post the date later, but it's already available in Canvas. And you can look that up, uh, all, all of the uh, uh, final exam uh, times uh, scheduled on the UNL's website, the registrar's website. Uh, but uh, a very high level introduction to databases. Uh, next semester, if you're taking 156 or 156H, then you'll be focusing a lot on databases. You'll be de uh, designing and, and building an entire database-backed uh, application. Uh, but uh, data, uh, the data is fundamental, as you've already seen. In fact, your last uh, assignment, uh, your last hack and your last assignment are focused on data processing, uh, mostly f uh, focused on, uh, on, on searching and sorting. But you're going to be doing a lot of stuff with that data. Uh, now, it's not a database per se, uh, but it is, it, it's the data that's been pulled from a database. Uh, instead, in C, you've traditionally represented data as integers, or strings, or structures. Uh, but data needs persistence. Persistence simply means, uh, not, not tenacity or anything like that, or keep, you know, persistence in English means you keep asking the same question over and over again until you get the yes, yes answer that you want, right? Uh, but persistence with respect to uh, com computing systems means that uh, data survives past the, uh, the lifespan of your program. Programs are ephemeral, meaning that they, they, they execute and then they're done executing very, very quickly usually. Uh, milliseconds, maybe a few minutes, maybe a few, uh, you know, a few hours if you're doing some uh, big, uh, big time data crunching. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, your program only has a finite lifespan. It begins and then it ends. You want data to persist from one, uh, one program execution to the next. And the way that you do that is you need a way to store that data. Uh, there are many ways to represent, uh, to, to store data. I should say uh, store data. Right? Uh, you've seen several of them already. Right? Let me go ahead and bring this over here. Uh, what is this? Uh, it's, a bunch of, it's, a, it's a bunch of data on books, right? Uh, it's got courses, titles, authors, topics, URLs. And then each line here is a different book. Right? Uh, what kind of formatting is this? Hint, hint, it's in the file name, CSV. What does CSV stand for? Comma separated value files, right? Uh, this is a flat file, right? Uh, CSV files, CSV, uh, CSV, excuse me, files are comma separated.
separated, separated value files, or, or they're also called flat files. They're called flat files because they're flat. You look at all the data. It's been flattened out onto a screen, basically. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got rows. Each row represents a record. And the, you do have columns, in a sense. The columns are delimited by uh, commas here. So it's kind of like an Excel file. An Excel file will have rows and columns of data. Uh, but it's essentially flat. Uh, you've also seen other types of data. Uh, what else have you seen this semester? Think back to your uh, processing of files in, in your lab. I forget, lab 10, I believe it was, if you remember back that far now. Right. Let me show you an example. Here's that same data, but in a different format. What is that? That's XML, right? Hint, hint, the file name tells you what it is. It's an XML file. Uh, we've got, uh, we, these are called tags. These uh, provide markup, uh, semantic meaning to the text in between. And it's all indented to show you that there's a hierarchy of data here. At the very top, we have books. Then we have uh, children elements, uh, the first book, the second book, the third book, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, closing, uh, closing tags end the opening tags. And so the first book begins at this tag and ends at this tag. It's just got that forward slash there on the, uh, on the tag. Within that, it's got course, title, authors, topics, and URL. So that's the exact same way of representing the same data, or that, that's a different way of representing the same data. Uh, it's a little bit better because now these things actually mean something. Over here in the books, the only way that I understood that this was, uh, this was related to a course, that this was the title, the second token here was the title, that the third token here was the, uh, uh, was the author name, was because I had to look up here to the header. If I didn't have that header, it's the same data, but there's no markup to indicate what this stuff means. Whereas over here in the books, everything uh, is semantically marked up. Everything has semantic meaning. Right? Here's a third way of doing it. I don't know if we looked at any of this, but we'll definitely look at this next semester. Well, uh, you, you pronounce that JSON, uh, and it's from Java, uh, it stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Uh, and uh, it's basically a more, uh, it, it's a, uh, people, uh, the, the reason it was developed was that people felt that XML was overly verbose. We've got this hierarchy developed. Over here, we didn't have a hierarchy with our flat file. But over here, at least we had a hierarchy. But look at all those repeated tags, course, 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 course. All of those are repeated over and over again, right? Uh, so XML can, kind of tends to be ver very verbose. We've got an opening tag and then a repeated closing tag. So JSON came along as a more lightweight uh, alternative. Uh, and it's also a subset of JavaScript. So it was developed in the JavaScript world. Uh, and it's now become a very, very common data interchange format. All three of these are data interchange formats. So there's, there, there's another alphabet soup today, right? Uh, we've, also, we've got CSV, we've got XML, which is ex, ex, extensible markup language. And note that the X is there for extensible, uh, which provides a, uh, a, a tree-like uh, hierarchy of data associations plus semantic tags. Right? Uh, and then you have JSON, which is JavaScript object notation, uh, which is a little more lightweight. Right? And lightweight is important if you're transmitting stuff over a network. Uh, because why send 500 bytes when you can get away with 200 bytes, right? Uh, it's it's going to be twice as fast to same, uh, send the same amount of data. Uh, all of these are basically flat files. All of these are basically data inter EDI, uh, uh, which is going to be electronic data interchange formats. Right? The reason that you need this is because you can be writing one system that's, that is working on Microsoft or uh, Windows hardware uh, with a Microsoft database written in C sharp, uh, uh, another language. Then you can come over here to a different system that's written in, J in the Java stack. And then a third system that is pure C for whatever reason, embe an embedded system. These systems need to talk to each other. And if they need to send data back and forth, you need a universal data representation in order for these disparate different systems to talk to each other. All three of these are one way of doing that. Right? All, they all fall short, however, with respect to uh, our, our purpose here, which is data persistence. You can dump stuff to a file, 
And uh, files are useful, but they don't provide a lot of the, sen the essentials that we need for a real system. Okay? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's lots of disadvantages here. Disadvantages. Right? Uh, to find a particular record, right? what do you need to do? Let me go ahead and go over to the CSV file. What if I was searching for uh, prologue and natural language analysis? Right? Even as a human, where do, uh, uh, you can't see where I was uh, uh, looking. Right? You, what would you do? You'd start scanning it from top to bottom until you found what you were looking for. And then you said, oh, OK, well, that's right there at the 8th or I guess 17th record. Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, 17th record. Right? A computer it, with a flat file, a computer is going to have to do the same thing. To find a particular record, the entire file needs to be processed. Uh, potentially, every record needs to be examined. Right? That can be very, very time consuming, especially if you've got millions, billions, or trillions of records in a uh, one gi big giant flat file. Not very, uh, not very good. Right? Also, there is no way for, or uh, no easy way, I should say, easy way for multiple programs or threads to access the same data. Right. Here, to understand that, think about a, a typical Word document. Open up a Word document, start typing stuff, save it. Now, try to drag that Word document to the trash. What's it going to say? What's it going to tell you if you try to do that? Can you delete a file that you've got open and that you're working on? No, why? It's because you know, it's the operating system saving you from yourself, right? So it's saying, no, you, you're working on this file. Are you sure you can't delete it, right? It's because it, it has what's called a file lock on it. So when a file uh, is typically opened, for, especially for reading, or it depends on how it's opened, but when a file is, uh, is opened, typically uh, the operating system puts a lock on it. And so this program over here is reading the file or writing to the file, doing something to the file. This program over here wants to read or write to the file. It can't because there's a file lock on it. So what, it haps, uh, what happens is it has to wait. Now imagine if we, had a, a data, uh, if, if we have data that 100 different programs or 100 different users in the same program were trying to access. We would only be able to service one, unit, uh, one, one uh, uh, user at a time. All those nine, uh, 99 other users would have to wait for the first user to get done. Right? That is a terrible design. Uh, that's how you, computers used to be. There, there, uh, there was no multi-threading. There was no multi or, or time sharing uh, and, uh, uh, back in the 50s, 60s, right? And so you literally had to schedule a, your program to be run. This is all, even all the way into the 80s, 80s I believe, uh, for mainframe systems. Uh, if you wanted to uh, run a program, you crossed your fingers, hoped that there were no bugs, scheduled your program to be run overnight or something, and then you get the re results back in a few days because you had to wait for everybody that got, in, uh, got ahead of you in order uh, to finish. Right? And if there was a bug, great, you got another three days of waiting after you fix the bug. Right? So there's a huge disadvantage there. Uh, it cannot be multi-threaded or multi-user. Data in files, it may also be incomplete. Right? Let me go ahead and go over here to the uh, CSV file. What's to stop me from putting in a record with no author. Right? I, just, I just deleted Bruce Eckel here. Right? Nothing. It's just a flat file. It's just a text file. There are no rules that can, to be enforced here. What's to stop me from, uh, there's no numbers here, but well, here, here's a URL. Uh, foo, right? Is that a valid URL? No. What's to stop me from doing something like that? There's no integrity here that is enforceable. Right? So flat files, flat files, uh, 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 they may be incomplete. Uh, there may be repet repetition of data. Uh, and, um, formatting may be violated. Uh, there may be data. This is the uh, anomalies, I think. OK, yeah, I think uh, my spell checker is not complaining about it, for a so we'll go with it. Uh, there, uh, there's no rules. Right? It's just a flat file. It's just a text file. You can mash the keyboard all you want. Uh, there's no, uh, there are no rules to be enforced here because it's, it, it's just a regular old file. Uh, there's also rep a repetition of data here. I've got three different books uh, listed for the same course. Uh, here I've got four books listed for the same course. 
Uh, up here, I've got three books for the listed for the same course. In other words, the course title is repeated over and over and over again for every record that's associated with it. When you've got repetition of data, you've got waste, and you've got pot uh, uh, potential failure points. Uh, what what happened? Maybe somebody entered the data wrong and they put in 155 instead. They forgot the A. Now suddenly, even though these are conceptually the same course as this course up here, that's no longer the case because the data is different. Or maybe I entered it correctly. It's just that I had some formatting differences. I used lowercase instead of uppercase like the rest of it. But as far as a computer program is concerned, these aren't the same thing unless you are doing comparisons based on case insensitive string comparisons. right? So there are a lot of potential issues here. The solution to all of them is an RDBMS. Right? So uh, again, alphabet soup here. Solution is an RDBMS, which is a relational database management system. Right? Uh, database is typically one word, but when it's uh, when it, when you abbreviate it or when you do a, uh, an acronym of it, it's usually always DB, right? Uh, a, a, a DB administrator or a DB writer or something like that, right? And in a real database, oops, I meant to do this. There we go. Oh, too many, too big. There we go. All right, uh, an R, uh, RDB, uh, uh, data is stored in tables, right? It's no longer a bunch of flat files. At the end of the day, the database is storing stuff in files, but they're a particular format that the database understands. Conceptually, they're stored in tables, and they're st stored in separate tables. Uh, uh, data regarding an author may be over here. Uh, data regarding a book may be over here. And then uh, associations between those would then, be, uh, would then be defined by the database. That this author over here wrote this book, and also, they wrote this book, and this book, and this book. And then uh, maybe we want to take that a step further. We've got a third table over there for courses. And then we can associate courses to the actual tables. Right? We can have uh, 50 different tables if we want. We can have 100 different tables with different uh, relationships between them. Now it's no longer a flat data file. Right? Over here, everything was in just one big giant file. Now everything is separated out, and we have some sort of a, a relationships being able to define between them. Right? Um, t individual tables, uh, individual tables, ha tables have rows, which are called records, and uh, tables have columns, which are individual pieces of data for each record. Right? Columns and individual. So at the end of the day, a table does look kind of like this. A table does kind of look like a flat CSV file. But there's a process called normalization. It's something that we'll do next semester, where you take a data model, say like books, authors, and uh, courses, uh, and then you separate them out into different tables. And then you normalize it by, by uh, this, this is the normalization process. You separate them out into different tables so that this, over here, this author table over here only has data that's associated with the author, last name, first name. Um, maybe some ID of some sort. And then that table over there that's responsible for books has the title and maybe in a, a, a reference back to the, uh, the, the author table over here to, uh, to determine who actually wrote this thing. That way we don't have repetition. Over here we've got one Bruce Eccle. Uh, and uh, there's not the three Bruce Eccles that wrote three different books uh, and, and, all, and, and that, that name is repeated over and over again. Not only that, but we've got a consistent way of formatting things. We separate out the first name and the last name so that we don't have the problem of, did somebody enter it as first name, space, last name, or maybe last name, comma, first, uh, space, first name? Uh, those will have their own individual columns in that table. And uh, those columns will have particular types, and they will have other rules that you can actually uh, enforce. Right? Uh, so for, uh, 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 columns have a particular type, type, such as a number, string, et cetera. Right? And there are a couple of others, but I'm going to keep it simple. We're only going to talk about numbers and strings here. Uh, and uh, rules can be, can be defined and enforced on the data. Right? You could do certain rules, for example, like uh, uh, numeric, uh, one, one obvious one would be that you wouldn't be able to enter in a hello 
for a numerical field, a numerical column. Uh, another one would be that you could enforce, uh, for example, uh, a value may not be negative. And if you, for example, a uh, current uh, price, right? A price could be uh, $5, $10, but a price of negative $3, that's bad data. That's anomalous data. We could put a rule, and these are called constraints in our database, that says any attempt to enter in a negative number into a record in this table for this column is an illegal uh, data. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's bad data. And the, uh, and the uh, database would enforce that rule and never allow that. Uh, we could have another rule that says that an author always has to have at least a last name. Maybe we don't want, uh, we don't want to be so uh, you know, strict and say, oh, maybe they don't have, uh, have a first name. But we could ha put in a rule that says that the last name is a required field. Right? We, so we could specify required fields. Right? We could do a lot of other things. Right? RD uh, and RDBMSs uh, solve more problems than just that. RDBMSs provide structure a means to enforce data integrity. Again, the, 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 these are called uh, constraints. Uh, Multi-user thread capabilities. You can open up uh, dozens upon dozens of different connections, parallel connections to a database, uh, database management system. And it, it's a lot harder to do that with uh, just a regular old file. Uh, security, authentication, et cetera, et cetera. Right? A lot of other bells and whistles come automatically when you decide to use a database management system uh, for free. Right? You don't have to add on your own security and, uh, and other stuff like that. Uh, they also provide what are called the ACID principles. Right? The ACID, uh, again, uh, we're going to have an alphabet soup today. Uh, the ACID principles stand for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So which, which is each of these? It all happen, has to do with what's called a transaction. So when you interact with a, a relational database management system, you are making a query to it. You're saying, insert this data, or retrieve this data, or delete that data that's already in there. Each one of those requests can be thought of as a transaction. You are making a query to the database and saying, please do this. Uh, you can have multiple queries in the same transaction. So suppose that uh, you can, uh, I, I tell the database, please enter this record, this first record, this second record, and then this third record. I can wrap that up as a one transaction. And then the database will, for, uh, will for enforce the ACID principles on that one transaction that consists of multiple queries. The first one being uh, atomicity. Atomicity. Right? So what, is atom, uh, what, what does atomic mean? Well, it now means uh, atoms, right? The, the, the small particles that make up matter. Uh, but, before, uh, but its English de definition, uh, even before that, would be uh, indivisible. Of course, we know that atoms can be divided now, so it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, but atomicity means that it cannot be divided. In other words, in this context, data modifications, that is transactions, transactions are an all or nothing process. So do, let's go back to those three queries that I wanted. I want to insert record one, insert record two, insert record three. Suppose that record three violates one of the rules, one of the constraints that I defined in the database. It has a negative value in that price uh, column. Well, one was successful, two was successful, but three was successful, but you wanted this in one transaction. That failure on the third one makes the entire transaction fail. And those two mod uh, modifications that you made in the beginning, it's like they never happened. It rolls back the transaction to the beginning, and it, was, it does, a, does a big undo, basically. And, uh, and it says, nope, the, 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 you can't do that. Uh, you violated a rule of this, or uh, it violates a constraint, so the entire thing didn't happen. Uh, if, some, if there's a catastrophic failure in, uh, in between them, then it's an all or nothing thing. It's like it, uh, if, if it fails for whatever reason in between any one of these transactions, it's like none of it ever happened. Right? Uh, which is a very good thing, because you don't want your database in an inconsistent state. Uh, that's the second one, consistency. Uh, database will always remain in a consistent state before and after any transaction. Consistent here means that all of the rules that you define for the database are enforced and that they're satisfied. Uh, you will, uh, if you said that this column cannot be negative, 
then it will never be negative. At, in, uh, in the middle of a transaction, it could be that the database decides that it's more efficient to go ahead and violate those rules for now, <coughs> as long as at the end of this transaction, I check those rules again, okay, well now it's satisfied, or no, it's not satisfied anymore, and I'll roll back that entire transaction as if it never happened. But before that transaction begins, and after that transaction is successfully done, all the rules are enforced, right? Uh, which is a very good thing, because otherwise they wouldn't be rules, they'd be suggestions, right? Uh, isolation, the third one, acid principles, the I and the acid principles. Uh, no transaction is, uh, inter interferes with another. This is what provides that multi-threaded, multi-user, multi-program capability. If you have one program that comes in and starts counting up records so that it determines, okay, well, there are only 10 records, I need to enter in a third or, or an 11th or something like that. And then another uh, transaction comes in and starts changing those records, maybe deleting them. The, the first transaction is completely unaware of the second transaction. It's like that. Uh, it, it, it's like the second transaction is not even be, uh, is not even occurring at the same time. Uh, the way that a, a relational database management system handles that is basically once a transaction starts, you get uh, it gets this this kind of uh, uh, view that only it can access. Even though both of these uh, uh, tr threads or programs can act independently on the database, they act in isolation. They won't be stepping on each other's toes. Right? <coughs> and then the, finally, you have durability. Once a transaction is committed, it remains so. That doesn't mean that the data is read-only. Right? You can go in and add a record, and then later in a different transaction, you can go in and delete it. But those are two separate transactions. Uh, once, this in, uh, once, this, uh, once this transaction that inserts this record is complete, it cannot go back. Right? Uh, it is immune from catastrophic failure. Once you've got a successful uh, 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 commit, then it, it, it's going to stay that way. And only another transaction can overwrite and, uh, and delete that data. Right? So those are the ACID principles. A relational database management system also provides CRUD. So here, again, alphabet, alphabet soup here. Uh, CRUD stands for create, retrieve, update, and destroy. Uh, and those are the four basic operations that you want in a database system. You want to be able to uh, have a means to create data, to insert data, to create new records. You want to be able to retrieve the data. Otherwise, it would be uh, write-only memory, <laughs> WOM, if you've ever heard of that before. WOM, write-only memory. Uh, you've, you've heard of read-only memory, ROM, right? Where once you've written it, then you can only ever uh, read it like a CD would be ROM, CD-ROM. Uh, because once you've, once you've burned, that, uh, burned that CD, and not a rewritable CD, but once you've burned that CD or DVD or whatever you're doing, then it, it's stuck, right? It's read-only memory. What is write-only memory? You can write it, but you can never read it. It's a joke, right? Uh, but without retrieve, we would have WOM. We would have write-only memory. So you can create data, you can retrieve it out of the database, you can update it. Existing records, I need to change the last name because it was a mistake, or I need to change the spelling of that, uh, that thing over there. You can always change stuff by updating it. And then destroying would be actually be removing a record. This record over here needs to be deleted, uh, and, and you can do that. Those are the four basic things that you need in a database management system, the, way, the, the ways that you can change the data or work with the data. <coughs> and it does all this through SQL. I think this is the last acronym that I'm going to give you today, uh, which is the Structured Query Language. Right? So it's yet another programming language. It's uh, completely different from C. It's, uh, it's called a declarative programming language, which is kind of a, a functional style thing. <coughs> and uh, we won't even get into it in this course. Of course, in 156, we'll learn all about SQL. Uh, you'll have several labs on it. You'll, you'll learn SQL back and uh, not backwards and forwards, but you'll be introduced to it at least. Uh, you'll be able to query out of a database system. It's quite old. I think it's, well, not that old. Uh, I think it was in the early 70s, developed at IBM. Uh, and it is the de facto uh, query language. Uh, it, there are lots of variants of SQL. Any, uh, any company that's building a and trying to sell a database will have uh, SQL and then uh, augment that with their own, like uh, I think Microsoft's is SQL T uh, or Transact T or something like that. Uh, or maybe that's, uh, maybe that's Oracle. 
Uh, I forget now, now I forget what Oracle's was. Uh, but uh, the, the SQL is the base language. Any database management system will support ba basic SQL. And then if you go and you, uh, you purchase another database system, they've got extensions that, to that language that basically add features to only their database. You, you want to stay away from using those kind of things because it enters you into what's called vendor lock. Uh, meaning that if you write a bunch of programs and uh, an entire infrastructure around this one database that uses the language of only that database, guess what? You're never going to be able to, uh, to purchase a new database system without those features. Uh, it locks you into that vendor and means that you're going to be paying them forever and ever again. Right? And it, it really er erodes your negotiating uh, uh, ability to, to, to negotiate lo lower prices. Right? So generally, you want to stay away from that kind of thing. Uh, database structures. Right. So uh, what does a data typical database look like? Again, tables have rows and columns. Right. Tables should, may, and should have a primary key. Right. A primary key is a unique identifier for every record in that, in that table, uh, a unique identifier in, uh, for every record in that table. Not in the database. Again, you can have 50 different tables. Each table will have its own primary key value. Right? Uh, usually, uh, you let the database generate and manage these keys uh, to ensure uniqueness. Right? You don't want to do key management yourself because it's a very difficult problem. It's a very difficult problem that's easily solved by using a relational database management system. Uh, you, can specify, you can specify rules such that every time uh, a new record is inserted, a new unique key will be generated by the database with a guarantee that it doesn't conflict with any other record in that, in that table. So if it's doing the heavy lifting for you, let it do the heavy lifting for you. Right? Uh, in addition, uh, records between two different tables may be related uh, through another type of key called a foreign key. Right? A, key. a foreign key is a key in one table that's an association back to a record in another table. Uh, foreign keys define a one to many relationship between tables. So for example, say that table A, we have table A and B, right? And say that t table, table B has a, an FK, uh, we, 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 we just shorten that up to for, a foreign key up to FK, reference to A's uh, primary key, PK, right? Uh, then there is a one to many relationship from table A to table B, okay? Let's visualize this, at least in our heads, and then I'll go uh, the, the, while, while I'm waiting for this to fire up here. Uh, hopefully it works. Come on. Maybe it won't work today. All right. So we'll just have to visualize this in our heads, or I can go up onto the, blo onto the blackboard here. Yeah. Uh, encryption, you said? Uh, in cer certain cases, it can. Uh, so the question was, can a database uh, automatically encrypt things? One of the things that it, uh, well, it doesn't, it's not encryption, it's a one-way hash function. But one thing that it does is it manages passwords to the database. And you don't want to be storing passwords in plain text. So uh, next, uh, next semester, when you get your database account, one of the things that you'll want to do immediately is change the password to something that, um, that, that you'll use. And the way that you can do that is you can go into the database and you can set the password. You call this function and it hashes your password to a hash. Uh, and then the hash is, it, it's, it's not an encryption because you can't go back to it. It's a one-way hash. But that's one of the things it can do. Um, it depends on the database, but I'm, I think that you could probably uh, encrypt the, uh, have the database encrypt it as long as you gave the key to the database. But the problem there is if you, would store, the, uh, if you store the encrypted data and the key in the same database, Right? That's just like putting the, your door key under, under the mat. 
right? You're putting the key right out front of the door that's locked, right? Well, there's, there's no security there whatsoever. Uh, so typically the, the key needs to be stored somewhere else or the key needs to be a password based key where you enter in a password and then that generates the key that was used to, to lock it up and the, then the, that unlocks it. Uh, and there are lots of schemes for doing that. Uh, whether or not a database management system supports it, you'd have to look, uh, read the documentation. <laughs> it's gonna vary widely, right? Uh, so unfortunately this is not working, but let's go back to uh, the example that we were thinking about before, where we've got an author and a book. What kind of, and books, authors and books. What kind of a relationship do you think would be between these two tables? One author is associated with many books, or many books are associated with one author. Or, may, or sorry, one, uh, one book is associated with many authors. It could be both, right? Uh, let's, let's, let's simplify it. Uh, an author typically writes several books, right? Uh, think about your favorite author, uh, let's say, I don't know, Douglas Adams or something. Uh, he, wrote, uh, he wrote several books, a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, Dark, uh, Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He wrote a dozen books or so, right? So we've got one author that has many books. Right? Now, one book could have several authors. There are many books out there that have multiple authors that collaborated to, to work together on that stuff, right? Uh, let's keep it simple. Uh, so is, uh, there might be a many-to-many -many relationship there. Let's keep it simple, though. Let's say that for the purposes of this database, one person can write many books, but one book only ha ever has one author. We have a one-to-many relationship. Where does the foreign key belong here? Who has the foreign key? The, the author over here has one foreign key. Well, they, they need to associate it with, uh, like, say, four books over here. Is one key going to be able to associate it with four books? No. But four books, each having the same key, back to the author over here, that's going to work. Right? So our foreign key is over here in the book table, where it has an, uh, a reference back over here to the author. Now, if an author is identified by a primary key, usually, right? that's, that's the way that you usually do it, then these are all pr uh, references to a foreign key over here in the author table. Right? So, uh, example. Say that we've got an, an author, author, and a book table, table, and we want to model the uh, situation where one author can write several books. Uh, not the other, the, the, the simplified situation here, right? So the book table would have a foreign key reference back to the author table's primary key. That way, here's a book record over here. Who wrote it? You can answer that question by looking at that foreign key reference. Following that foreign key reference back over here to the primary table and looking up who, uh, which author is associated with that, that primary key? Because it's unique, it's guaranteed to be there. And because you have uh, a the ACID principles, consistency, you can put in a rule that says that this foreign key over here has to be associated with an existing record over here. And because that rule is enforced, you're guaranteed to find that offer, author. You won't have any what are called dangling keys. For example, suppose I've got Douglas Adams over here and he wrote these four books. What if I deleted that record? Douglas Adams no longer exists. What happens to these four records over here? Who wrote them? Well, here's the foreign key. I follow it back over here and look at all the records and I don't find anybody because that record has been deleted. These are now orphaned, children, uh, the orphaned records. And the, the, why? Because I've been going left and right here, but it's really a hierarchy. Up here we've got a parent record, and down here we've got the children records. A parent, uh, the children cannot exist without the parent. So if you go and delete the parent, then they become orphaned records, and you don't want that. Yeah? Okay, yes, the, you would, because you need to distinguish these four books. Uh, if you don't have a primary key, then what if I entered the same book twice? Right? Uh, then that, uh, that, that, that would be bad data, because, well, uh, it's redundant. Uh, which record is the real record, right? Uh, lots of problems there. Right? So uh, in that example, we would have a 
uh, a parent-child relationship from the uh, author table down to the book table. Uh, there can also there can also be uh, many to many relation relationships right? relationships. You can uh, modify your uh, your model so that one author can write multiple books and one book could have multiple authors. Right? And unfortunately, I, I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll redraw the picture on Monday when I, uh, hopefully this thing is working on Monday. Uh, but basically, you've got a many-to-many -many relationship. You've got books over here. And you've got authors over here. Now, in our first model, the way that we modeled it was that one author can have multiple books. The way that you do that is... This is ca called an entity relation diagram. So, sorry, I lied. I, I've got, I just gave you another alphabet soup ER diagram. Entity relation diagram. It's difficult to see here, but uh, there's a, uh, a single record over here. And then I've got this chicken foot over here, which uh, spreads out into three, giving you the, uh, uh, the, the impression that there are many records over here. So this is a one-to-many relationship in our first model. What would our second model look like? Whoa, giant. Here's the books again, and I'll give myself some more room here. Here are the authors. I need a many-to-many -many relationship there. In other words, I need two chicken feet coming out. Right? Now, how do I do that relationship? Generally, with a foreign key, a foreign key only defines a one-to-many relationship because you've got multiple records over here with the same foreign key value referencing the one record over here. There's no way for you to have just two, uh, there's, there's no easy way for you to have two tables associated uh, where one record is associated with several records over here and one record might be associated with several records over here. So what you need in between is another table. This is called a join table. You are joining these two uh, tables together so that you can model a many-to-many -many relationship. Right? Typically, a join table is placed between them. The way that this works is, again, suppose that we have, uh, I'll, call, I'll call their primary keys over here, say a book ID, and I'll call it an author ID over here. Now, these are the primary keys. All I need to do is have two foreign keys in my join table over here, a book ID and an author ID. Now, typically, you name them the same things, and you, you keep uh, consistency in all your naming conventions just like you do in programming, because databases are programming. It's just a different language. Right? So, all I need to do is look at a record over here in this join table. See, oh, there's the book ID. It's associated with this book over here, say, Long Dark Key, Time of the Soul, and an author ID, and it's associated with this author over here, Douglas Adams. Right? That's the way that I can have an association with an author and a book, and then I can support multiple relationships back and forth. That same Douglas Adams uh, record over here could be have multiple records in the join table that refer to multiple records over here in the, uh, in the book table, and vice versa. I could have a book record over here that has several records over in the join table that is associated with several authors over here, right? uh, and then they've got, uh, and, and then we've got a, then we've got a book that has multiple authors. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? All right, we are going to cut it short today so that we can uh, accommodate our guest that's going to be uh, administering a survey and gathering some data. Uh, but what we're going to do on Monday, on when, when we come back on Monday, I am going to, we are going to design a database together without knowing a single line of SQL. You are not going to have to know any SQL. You're just going to have to know the basic, uh, the, the basic principles. We wrote all of the stuff for you. You just have to use it. Uh, it's a, it we're going to design a video game database where you've got video games, uh, you've got publishers, 
and you've got uh, consoles, or, or, or I, think, I think we call them what it, uh, platforms. We call them platforms because that not everything is a console, right? Uh, the PC gamers out there would, would say so. Uh, and so uh, we're going to design a database to support that model. Uh, and then once we've designed that database in lab on the last, uh, uh, in the last week, you're going to use our API, you're going to use our program that, uh, to insert records, insert your favorite uh, uh, video game, pull records out, and play around with that database. Okay?